we, you guys talk about a case study of a psychotherapy practice and that plots the status of effectiveness of the therapist within that practice over, over several years. Mm. And it's mentioned how the, the results of the decades of work and the searching on how to improve, improve care uh, was, was done, but yet you allude to how that process uh, met some challenges and there were dead ends at times. Can you help the, the listener appreciate just from a, um, a backstory perspective of some of that process? Sure. So the case example, which is a research study that was published in 2016, together with a variety of colleagues, looked at a treatment center, lots of therapists, including students, and we tracked them for an average of five years, but some of them up to 17 years. Each of these people had their outcomes measured at every single visit with every client. And the question was, do clinicians improve with time and experience? So far in the history of our field, most of the research designs were cross-sectional, meaning that in order to tease out whether or not experience made a difference, we compared a group of experienced therapists to people that were just newly minted, perhaps, and then with students. There are problems with that kind of design. So this was a first to in time track clinicians and what we found is that clinicians not only did not improve they actually got worse not dramatically worse but slowly deteriorated over time which is in contrast to what most of us believe in fact the majority of us see ourselves as, as improving continuously over the course of our career over the pandemic, that particular study, I'm very proud to say, and perhaps because it was super controversial, was replicated by an independent group of, of researchers out of Germany. They found exactly the same finding. Experience is no guarantor of outcomes. And in many ways, I feel like we already knew this as a group of researchers ourselves. We'd been on a journey almost from the start of my professional career, really trying to figure out how could we get better. And I wasn't unlike, I think, most clinicians. I trusted that what I was being taught in graduate school would make me more effective than, say, your Lyft driver or the person who does your hair. Turns out there's not much evidence of that. It's a very unsatisfying conclusion, but we wanted to figure out how to get better. So we started with learning treatment models. In fact, early on in my career, I moved to a location where a very specific form of treatment was being developed. I became a very confident clinician in the process. We then invited some outright side researchers to come in and look at our effectiveness. And they had, they told us, good and bad news. The good news was we were effective. The bad news was we weren't any more effective than anybody else in the history of our field. And that was a pain point, to use your term. It really meant that what we had devoted our time and effort to, which was developing a treatment approach, a protocol that we would then teach to others in the hopes that if they replicated it with fidelity, their outcomes would get better, simply was a dead end. At some point, that led us to decide that maybe we would never figure out how to do therapy effectively in a way so that everybody could replicate it and be super effective. But we could measure because we each knew that sometimes we were helpful with certain clients and at other times we weren't. Oftentimes, we couldn't figure out why. There were lots of theories in the field, often ones that attributed most of the responsibility for that failure to the client and their premorbid functioning. But I have to tell you, that wasn't a very satisfying conclusion. So we began measuring. We developed a couple of very simple measurement tools. We administered them on an ongoing basis. And we discovered something curious that had been talked about before, but not much. And that was certain therapists year after year rose to the top of the heap in terms of their effectiveness. And they weren't just a little more effective than average. Their clients changed about 10 times faster than average therapists. You can just think of the possibilities here about, say, addressing the current crisis we have in the U.S. about 
access to care, given the rise in mental health concerns over the course of the pandemic. We had no idea what that was, was about. Other researchers largely confirmed this. A 2004 study by Okishi said the same thing, but ended the study curiously saying, hey, we know that these super shrinks, they call them, exist, but it's a mystery as to how they do it. And that brings us right up to this point in about 2006, 2007, when we were about to give up. We thought it was treatment models. It wasn't. We thought it was about learning basic core clinical skills. Didn't seem to have anything to do with that. Didn't seem to have anything to do with our comprehensive diagnostic and evolving code. And I happened to be on a flight going coming home from Sweden, having done some training there. And I picked a magazine out of the front pocket, it's a magazine I had never read before, called Fortune Magazine. And in there, there was an article about a psychologist I had never heard about before. His name was Anders Ericsson. And Anders Ericsson had been laboring away in the vineyard, so to speak, privately and alone, with a very small group of colleagues trying to figure out why were some performers within a given domain, chess, computer programming, music, why did they excel when the rest of us, and I include myself in that, remained largely average, despite most of us spending more time at our work than on any other activity that we do over the course of our lifetime? And we still are average, and we don't get better. Erickson's idea about this was an activity he called deliberate practice, and he indicated that deliberate practice, which is defined as spending time at the edge of your performance, reaching for a new objective, a performance objective that's just beyond your current ability. And the more you did that, the more you were at your edge, the greater the likelihood that your performance would inch up over time. That's and so that led to eventually the book Better Results, where we were spelling out, in essence, the steps that clinicians need to take if they want to get beyond the illusory improvement in their outcomes that so many of us trust and really get down to improving the results we have with the people we work with. Hear the entire episode for free on iTunes, Spotify, other favorite podcast players, or go to mechanicalcareforum.com.